This week on Breaking Ball, Claire entered the bidding as the stakes spiral in the Monster Championship. Stefan White remembers a day when Loud made a big noise. And in London, the GAA reaches out beyond the four green fields. A weekend of upsets, earthquakes and heartaches. You know, the usual. Both of last year's All-Ireland champions stepped out into the championship traffic. Meath, however, forgot to look both ways. Leash were wiped off the map, but Armagh grind relentlessly onward. Enough of the chaff. Here's the wheat. For weeks before the championship, Offaly's footballers were off the radar, presumed dead. How well they played in the afterlife. Skipping his way past. No, can he take the shot? He can! Me, the All-Ireland and Leinster champions, are about to say bye-bye to their titles. And me, they're out of the Leinster and All-Ireland championship. Offaly have made amends. And Porrig Nolan, the Offaly manager, departs the scene. Congratulate Sean Boylan. TJ Ryan only left him alone for a second, which was twice as much time as Joe Dean needed. Absolutely brilliant goal. You will hardly see a better goal this year. Setting off on his solo run, the most Martin Flanagan might have hoped for was a handy free. Strange for football to exceed expectations so wildly. He's been threatening to do it all afternoon with these great mazy runs. In the normal course of events, young Thomas McGrain would have driven those frees over the bar. He'll never have such bountiful misses again. This is just going off the crossbar. Comes back to Sean Duggan, and it's in the mix. On their big day all those years ago, Sligo were radiant and white. Where has the time gone? Darling, happy anniversary. I find it very hard to believe that it's 25 years ago since Sligo won a Connacht final. And um, I suppose we thought we'd be winning Connacht finals every second year after that, but it, it wasn't to be. We just didn't have that killer instant. We relaxed, maybe see the winning post and not ever get past it. Now, in 75, it was different. We were very focused in 75. Straight away, Mick Laffey for Sligo, putting it up towards Des Curtins. Des not controlling it. Mick Higgins for Mayo. It was always a hard luck story here in Sligo. Uh, they were talking about uh, courses on us and that you'd never win it, and some priests did this and some priests did that in some other place. But we were very unlucky in the sense that we had numerous draws. In Sligo, uh, they were talking about uh, courses on us and that you'd never win it, and some priests did this and some priests did that in some other place. But we were very unlucky in the sense that we had numerous draws and still never happened to win the replay except the 75 one. Well, Sligo would play well for 50 minutes and we'd get better in the last five or six minutes or ten minutes and that was the story always. And I was determined that Sligo weren't going to get better in the last ten minutes. The first two balls that went into Mickey, he kicked the first one with his left foot and he kicked the next one with his right, right foot over the bar. Two points at the very start. Burns Murphy sending it right down to Maddie Hoy. And that's not a bad-looking kick from Matty Hoy. It's a good point there. Level again. Our midfield had been very dominant during most of that game, and this Barnes at centre-back, we had that section of the field well covered. But in the last five minutes, our two midfielders just seemed to, to disappear. Maybe the, their legs probably gave, but Mayo took over for the last five, six minutes and got two points. But we just held on, you know, held on to get through by a point. But tragedy there'd be for Sligo now if this ball finished in the back of the net. J.P. Keane lobbing it across. Is he looking for his point? He's looking for it, and he's got it. There's only one between them. And the game is over, and Sligo won the Connacht Championship. I, I remember uh, the uh, end of the game in Castlebar, and I remember the next week more so than I do the, any of the game. Uh, the celebrations were high here in Sligo for the week, and I suppose it was a bad thing, really, and us involved in an All-Ireland semi-final. Some of our lads, I have to say, the, the cup was full. I don't know who filled it up, but uh, it was brought all over the place and some uh, of them never Barnes, took their Barnes, head out. Barnes filled it and we emptied it. <laughs> <laughs>
This was our All-Ireland final. Sligo hadn't won a Connacht final in 47 years, and this was our All-Ireland. And we could have stopped that, did Mickey, and said, well, look, we're not going to Co Park. I know it was great to go to Co Park, but we weren't really prepared for it. Little did we know that we were going to meet probably the greatest team of all time. He's on just outside the 21, and he takes his shot and sends it over the bar. And there's a goal! About to be tackled, but gets his pass into John Egan, and it's another goal! Sligo, their first All-Ireland semi-final since 1928, has resulted in bitter disappointment for them. As it happened afterwards, we were very disappointed, but when you look back on it in hindsight, we didn't need to be too disappointed because Kerry proved that they were the greatest machine of all time. I just turned 25, so I suppose, as you could say, since 1975, I mean, since the success, I've been literally hearing about it all my life. You want to get that memory out of people's mind that 75 isn't going to be the last time. That's not going to be so long, and every year that it goes on, it's a year longer, you know? I suppose you are really chasing ghosts a lot until, until you actually you know, until you actually go one further and, and, and win the championship again. You think that someday your day, sometime your day has to come, but, you know, you have to work for it. And, I mean, it mean, it mean everything I know to this present day team to win a kind of championship and to, to win something with Mickey Moore as well, it, it, it mean an awful lot to Sligo people. At the present time, we need to break through badly here to, to lift the game again. Definitely the support is here and the need to be winning games to maintain that support. And we thought we'd be winning several Connacht kind of finals since 1975, and it's just sad that we haven't won anyone since. Rory Gallagher sets the record straight. Raymond Gallagher, well, he powered it into the net. After years in the desert, Fermanagh and the Gallagher cousins have arrived at an oasis. Two championship wins in as many years, and Donegal there for the taking on Sunday. This is no time for a mirage, boys. Well, I played my first match from Anna from, from when it was 18, 1893. Kind of missed a year, year and a half through injury. The style of Raymond Gallagher comes out and makes it his. All the snows for Tom. Shane King, Gallagher again. I firstly had a groin injury, which kept me out for roughly eight months. And I, I was, wasn't too long back after that. And I, I tore a cruciate ligament in my knee. And that kept me out for another guts of a year, you know. So it was, it was very hard at that time because um, it was, you know, I was in around 18, 19, and it was one of the busiest times for a footballer. You know, you have minors, under 21s, seniors, and I missed out on a lot. And it was, you could never see yourself coming back at times. You know, it was very tough. Yeah, it helped with Raymond being on the panel, but obviously there was other fellas um, there already that I knew, and uh, just helps going to training with someone you know all the time. And me and Raymond travel together and have done since then. We've improved, yes, but uh, we haven't done too well in that this year's only been our second championship victory and yet we're still only in the first round of the championship. We have improved in that our squad is probably stronger and with more uh, quality footballers than what went before. And hopefully this year will show real improvement in getting, to, getting beyond Sunday's match against Donegal. Well, obviously for myself and Raymond, we'll be very keen to put one over them. You know, we, we know a fair few of the lads actually are from Ballyshannon, which is just over the road. But there'll be a number of supporters who have their hats in both counties and it'll be a very sweet one for us. I would be of the opinion that they're the, the best team that I've certainly been involved with and hopefully uh, this year's championship will prove that from this current Fermanagh team are the best team that has come out of the county. The club was always right behind us and uh, they gave us good support uh, right through from county minors, under 21s to seniors. Um, it was great when Raymond got on the senior team, our club hadn't had a representative on the county team in a long number of years and it was something for all of us that was younger to aim up to. You can see Fermanagh have improved so much, it's more, than, it's more the thing that in Ulster especially the the counties have kind of, you know, they've evened out. But maybe the, the exception, if you look at this year, Derry seemed to be very, very strong, you know. But uh, that was typified, I think, by Antrim's victory over Down a fortnight ago. I think it's good for Ulster football that, uh, you know, the counties are all around the same standard and, you know, there's no weak county now as such, and it can only be good for football. I wouldn't be anxious about playing Donegal, it's just another county. And I suppose when we're living right on the Donegal border, there'd be a few bits of slagging going on but it's just we look at it as another match and one we have to try and win. The club I uh, undertook a redevelopment of the, the playing facilities here um, just la at the start of last year and as we're right on the on the Donegal border the nearest uh, pitch to us was Bally, the Arua Club in Ballyshannon which is in County Donegal. 
Manor's greatest strength at the minute is that it's a, it's a balanced team. We're, we're all ver very young. I think probably Tommy Callahan or Paul Brewster are, are the oldest, and they're 27, 28. So it's a nice, young, balanced team, and very fresh and fit and eager to do well. That's probably our main strength. On Sunday, all roads lead to Parky Keeve. Claire and Tipperary in the Munster Championship. The match of your dreams and cheap at twice the price. Let Niall Gilligan show you around. Probably the Munster final was where uh, we came off the wagon last year, you know. It was very disappointing having... The final was where uh, we came off the wagon last year, you know. It was very disappointing having played so well the second day against Pitch, you know, and then in the Munster final, just to be narrowly beaten at the very end. And then after that, uh, we found it hard to lift it after that, you know. One of the main lessons um, would have to be um, to improve on our consistency. 1998 and 99, we were great at putting one game together and then uh, down up for the next game. You know, it was a great honour for any player, you know, and uh, it was a nice consolation at, at the end of the year, even though it was the first year in, in a good year that I, I, I failed to win a medal. You know, either be a Munster Championship or an All Ireland or an All Ireland club, you know, so hopefully we'll put that right for the year 2000. Claire are the All Ireland Hurling Champions, and Anthony Daly lifts the McCarthy Cup. Anthony um, got a great run at it, you know, and uh, was the most successful player captain ever in two All Irelands and three Munster Championships. And if Brian uh, can have the same success, I'm sure uh, no, no one will quibble. I think things are back looking well again this year, um, and we have some there's many new players pushing for places, you know. Um, Jerry Quinn, John Redden, um, Tony Griffin, many players like that, you know, they'll be all pushing hard to try and stake a place. Okay. Oh, Nile, how are you doing? How are things? That's a bad time. Ah, sure, not too bad. I got your phone called there yesterday. Yeah. You know, yeah. You, you were talking to the father, you're thinking of sitting out. I think I'll let him go, yeah. You got the middle of the shop, yeah? Yeah, I've got the middle of the shop, yeah. I don't think they're over the hill at all, you know. Um, the average age of the team is 25 or 26, you know. And there's still many young players coming in, you know. I think it's, it's a good blend of experience and youth. Yeah, seven metres, Kevin. Yeah. I think it's maybe unfair our managers have to name the team on a, on a, on a Tuesday night, you know. Um, it's what, five days before the big game, you know. Players can change, and even uh, if, if any people have been involved in over, in over the team, like their own ideas can change nearly right up to the hour before, you know. And it doesn't bother me that he doesn't name the team, you know. Since we're, Eight years of age, playing hurling or seven years of age, we've always learned that the team's been named just today to me. Tipperary uh, has some fine talent, you know, and um, they won a Not Ireland Minor in 1996, you know, and many of those players are coming through, you know, with John Carroll and Mark O'Leary and some of those, and they're showing very well, you know, so it's been very difficult to beat, and there's a great rivalry there between Tipperary and Clare, you know, and on and off the field, it, you know, there'll be tough confrontations, you know, so. I'm looking forward, it should be a great day out in Cork again. Uh, Philip Merle is a new player and, and uh, I haven't seen him really hurling, you know, but um, there's great talk about him down around Tipperary, you know, and he has, he has two great cornerbacks either side, even Michael Lyon and, and Neem Sheedy, you know, so, but, you know, he able to pull back down there, you know. Some people said that I, I was uh, known as the three-point man. This is Niall Gilligan. Wanted to give Claire the best possible start to the second half, and he's done exactly that. Looking for a Claire score. And he's put it over the bar. If I was guaranteed three points every day I'd go out, I wouldn't, I wouldn't quibble with that. You can only really take it one game at a time. As I say, oh, many questions like that are very hard to answer now. You know, June the 11th, as I say, will be the day when all those questions will be answered, and maybe if Claire can get over that day from then on, once the final, all on the semi final, and then hopefully the final. Certainly, June the 11th uh, is not just the day for Niall Gilligan and the Clare team, but for Nicholas English and his Tipperary players. I don't believe that Tipperary will be coming in as well prepared as they were last year, bearing in mind that they did so as league champions. Uh, this year, they lost the league final. Uh, they were not over impressive against Waterford. They need to improve in their finishing. Tipperary will be looking for another good performance from John Lahey and hoping that their team captain, uh, Tommy Dunn, can improve on his performance.
there seems to be an acceptance in Clare that they didn't train as intensively last year as they say they have done this year. Uh, you have a new focus, a new captain, new selectors, and the message coming through is that they're going to be much better prepared. It all seems to be coming right for the Banner County, Clare by six or seven points. In Connacht this year, Sligo are under pressure to deliver and I feel it could be Mickey Moran's last year with them. Mayo's preparations have been disrupted by injuries and suspension. Uh, certainly a big test for Pat Holmes and his players. Sligo are coming in on the back of a quite a good league campaign and the memory of the very good performance against Galway in Smartfish Park. I believe they can raise their game there and produce a good result. Sligo by two points. Mick Award doesn't need to be reminded that Loud dumped Kildare in 1991, shortly after Kildare had almost won the league. Loud have won the Division 2 of the National League, and given that they defeated the Offaly team, which since they thrown the All-Ireland Champions, that has to give them a lot of confidence going into this game. Kildare's main strength is in defence, where Glen Ryan is still performing a valuable role. They also have this ability to win position all over the field, but they yet have to find the winning formula for putting it over the bar. Kildare by eight points. Kildare football at a stage that time where I would say on a very much on a high because uh, Nick O'Dwyer had taken over the team the previous autumn. Loud had played in Division 3 and Kildare were just narrowly beaten by a good Dublin side in a, in a National League. Even playing at home in Drogheda here, we were total outsiders against a Kildare team who were hotly fancied, not alone to beat us, but to carry on to win at Leinster possibly and, and also chances of an Ireland success in, in the same year. They thought they would probably get it tight for maybe three quarters of the game and easily beat Loud maybe with five or six points to spare. The place was packed to capacity, as you can imagine. You know, the, the banks and that are full. And we had trained here a couple of nights previous to that with very little people here. And then the next time you actually are on the field, you, you feel as if you're in a totally different place because the atmosphere was, was incredible. I think Kildare, I think, had, I think they maybe went in at, at the break leading a couple of points, but they kind of felt that if they hadn't come out of maybe second or third gear for us, you know, uh, they probably looked at the stage you know, that maybe the match could be won in the early second half. The dressing room at, in, at half time was, was, we felt that we hadn't, had, we didn't play and we didn't do ourselves justice for any part of the match. Lara McCavitt staying in around the goal mouth, but to Declan Kerrigan! Oh, what a goal! Surprisingly enough, it kind of stayed the kind of two or three points difference to maybe midway through that half. Kevin O'Hanlon intercepts, giving it down to John Osborne. Ball breaks inside to Stephen White. I just said, here, here goes and had a goal. He was at 20 yards, just went into, stepped into the corner of the net. At that stage, that put us a couple of points ahead. And I think with, even with roughly about 10 or maybe 12 minutes left still in the match, we kind of felt that we could have hung on for, for, uh, for a victory. I think a couple of minutes went by then, and I think uh, Jarlick Gilroy came on, and I think with his first touch of the ball, he broke our hearts and loud hearts with, with a goal. It kind of knocked the stuff on over, I have to say, in that sense, because I think in, in any game, the quickest response to, to any uh, goal or that that's scored is to get a score yourself straight away, and I think that's what Kildare done. I just could have feel to, to leave one point in it. After that free kick was kicked out, I think Seamus catches a ball in midfield and takes a solo, and then he, he kicks a ball down to Cahill. He kind of lost his footing for a straight or two, and then he got it, and I had broken away for my man and to scream for it, Cal could get it to me, he got it to me and I just took it on my chance and, and stuck it away. <laughs> I don't remember actually the last, next couple of seconds, you know, because at that stage it was only a matter of getting back out and, and making sure that they didn't get another goal. And at that stage everybody was just screaming for the whistle. Normally there would be another member or two to be played, but the final whistle weren't. The Lily Whites are out of Leinster. Incredible scenes in Drogheda. Pandemonium everywhere, I think, both on the field and off the field. 
Yeah, it was an incredible moment at that time, and I think it lived long in, in a lot of players' minds and supporters' minds in this ground. Anyway. Woo! My name is Francis Ugu. I am 10 years old, and I live in London, South Wales. I've got one brother, a mum, and a dad. My mum and dad moved to London before I was born and before my brother was born. When I grow up, I want to be a scientist or a lawyer or maybe even Gaelic footballer. I've been playing Gaelic football because it was introduced to my school by a coach first who came after school. Then we started getting lessons during school for peeing and uh, I went to the P1 with my class and the one after school as well and that's how I developed my skills. I think the game is very good. You don't have to be good at football or tennis or anything else. You can just be good at that one game. Yeah, I think I've improved very much since I started. Uh, in the areas of everything, picking up the ball, passing the ball, catching the ball, kicking the ball, and all the aspects. And George's school is done the, the outskirts of London. It's situated in the London borough of Harrow. Um, most of the children are, are of some ethnic minority. The largest group are of second generation children would be Irish children, but not by very much. The Gaelic football uh, fulfills all the requirements of the, the national curriculum as regards games um, and in many ways um, children are coming to it fresh and, and so don't have preconceived ideas or, or preconceived notions of their ability at a particular sport. It really does need extra support, extra financial support. Um, Johnny who we've got coaching here I know at the end of this year isn't available um, and it, I would really like to see, in order to kickstart Gaelic football in schools in London, the appointment of a full-time coach. It might turn out that Francis loves Gaelic football um, and that he wants to continue, that he, he doesn't particularly like football, he doesn't particularly like basketball. And if we were to say to him, well, I'm sorry, Gaelic football goes because the coach goes, um, that's a possible Gaelic footballer for life, a possible London player. If children were not learning, if children were not interested and children were not enjoying the Irish music or the Gaelic football, then they would vote with their feet and not turn up. I'm a youth development officer here in London for the Gaelic Games, both hurling and football. So I cover all of the schools in London and throughout the southeast of England. The first day I came here, a uh, bit overawed with the whole scene, you know, taking out primary school kids. Um, went to ask them, did any of them know about Gaelic football? few of them said, you know, parents are Irish and stuff like that, so I thought, alright, yeah, but brought them out, and uh, they were really took to the game straight away, you know, didn't take too much uh, coaxing at all. We cover all the basic skills, how to pick up the ball, hand passing, throw tapping, bouncing, then you get on to the tactics of tackling, blocking, uh, positions, players' positions, we've got a London Championship coming up, where all the primary schools take part in a particular competition, and then the secondary schools will also take part in the competition, so that's what we're aiming for. We have an after-school club in all the schools now at the moment and uh, the numbers for this school now are 47 people in the after-school club who uh, turn out every week. So it's got a good reception so far, so, so hopefully it'll carry on to club level and then in the you know, not-too-distant future maybe these, some of these kids will progress on to inter-county level with London. He's flying. I haven't pulled back for anything for the kindness, you know, he's, he's really taking into it. His mother was there at uh, the after-school club there last week, and so there was a lot of parents out and they all enjoyed it. But uh, he's really taking a keen interest in it, to it at the moment, so hopefully he'll, he'll carry it on and bring it on to a further level. Next week on Breaking Ball, number ones by twos.